Hey, Jared. Hey, Glenn. Call right at supper time for the cats here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try and do three things at once. How you doing? Um, these days I'm just, you know, I'm job searching, looking for a job. I've been out of work. Yeah. As soon as I get a job, Glenn, uh, I'll try to um, uh, send you some uh, some cash for that phone bill. Yeah. Well, we do what we can when we can, eh? Yeah. So, um, how'd the trial go? How's uh, your mom? Oh man, well my mom, she's um, that's another reason why I'm I'm hunting jobs yeah. these days because she's it's just she has dad? Too much, yeah my dad he's just getting worse you know it's just the inevitable is happening and and my you know my mom she could just I don't know she could use a little bit more help I guess you know yeah I want to put more like food on the table. Stuff yeah. like that, because it's just too much work, you know. She has to take care of him, you know. We all take, we all like have like uh, take turns with my brothers and stuff for feeding him yeah. and stuff. But she does like the main, like she she has, she cleans him and stuff. She like showers him and stuff. But she she, she you know she she stays active. Hey. She's my mother. She stays active. She she likes to dance. She goes dancing a lot. Is she? Yeah, she's a... You get uh, along with Jennifer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, man, I'll be worried about you, man, Uh, the last couple weeks, man, because I'm just thinking, like, wow, man, like, the the system... They won't leave me alone, eh? (laughs) You're alone now, you know? Ironically, you know, like, it's like, damn, man, you know? You just want it to be with your wife, you know, and they they can't, like, no, they don't want it. Well, it, it started with <clears throat> Tom last November. They gave him uh, prednisone, and I said, uh, they're starting the process. It's called marination. You, uh... Kill them a little bit at a time, and then uh, it looks like it's a normal activity uh, when you finally knock them over. And, uh, of course, they did that in February. I told you. I think that um, they they asked me whether or not I um, preferred attempts at resuscitation, and I told them that why would you ask me that? He's not even sick. What he's doing is living out the conditions you've created for him and if you feed him intravenously it'll work he'll be back on his feet this afternoon well by four o'clock in the afternoon they were preparing for his death and by five o'clock he was apparently dead for all intents and purposes. And uh, uh, I went I went and had a look and I said, you know, there's there's a number of things wrong here. Um, when people are going to die, somebody shuts their mouth. Here, somebody opened his mouth. His neck is leaning backwards. His mouth is wide open. 
Why did they they put him in bed with his underwear on underneath the hospital gown? And why did they take he he always wore two pairs of socks, a thin one underneath and a heavier one on top. And they took the two pairs off and put the outside one back on. Why would you do that to a corpse? And, uh, of course, when the uh, coroner called and I was telling him that uh, it's no sense talking to me because he didn't want to hear the story. All he wanted to do was find out uh, what had happened uh, at the hospital so he could make up a story around it. And uh, he started reading from his notes, and I put Jennifer on, and Jennifer said, that's not right. Four minutes of resuscitation for, are you out of your mind, four minutes? If they went through the procedure of a nurse, it would be at least an hour before they'd give up, not four minutes. And when he said... Um, what uh, intravenous stuff he was getting, and Jennifer said, there's something that you're saying here that only means they killed him. Because you have an intravenous bottle at the top and you have a needle in the arm, but there's another gadget that they were using in the middle where they put something in and fed it to him. So, uh, he said, if you read the notes of the doctor, the doctors that did it, there were two Hindus, from what I can understand, females, uh, and a lot of help at the hospital. They had done this many times before. There was a cleanup crew for the... Uh, the people that work with the system and at one stage of the game they become uh, a pain in the ass or a danger of uh, speaking out about what they know so they kill them and all of the evidence that I've seen is that it was murder and they would not give me a copy of the death certificate. They still haven't. Wow. And they said uh, they were going to give it to his daughter. Well, his daughter hadn't seen him in uh, at least the time I've known him, which was 16 years or so. Uh, and... Uh, uh, they were going to bury him in some uh, secret hideout place type of thing. And I said, Tom asked that he be buried on the farm. And I'm his legal guardian, and I don't care what you say about it ends on the minute he dies. I said, nobody would sign a legal guardianship if they knew the whole thing was rigged to um, go out of uh, compliance or out of action the minute the person died. The reason you do it is after he dies or if he's in a mental state where he can't make decisions on his own. This guy was asking me for my pen so he could sign his lottery ticket at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Where did he get the lottery ticket? I had given it to him in the morning. I went into the drugstore and bought it for him. I came out, got into the van with John, and I gave him his lottery ticket. Now... He's lying in a bed in a hospital gown. He has no clothes on. 
His clothes are piled on a bench under the bed. And he pulls out the lottery ticket. Where did he get it? Who gave it to him? Why did they need to have it signed? So I gave him my pen and he signed it and gave me back my pen. And the doctor, one of the the main nurses asked him, uh, how do you like the prednisone? He said it gave me a high, not like some other stuff I've taken, but it made me feel like a teenager. So he wasn't in any state of dying. Anyways, as soon as I told them that I was launching an investigation and that the cell would be looking at all the aspects of that, the president of the hospital quit with no advance warning. He just, I guess when they told him what was going on, what they, they had done, he got out of there in one hell of a hurry. Wow. And since then, they have been looking for a replacement, and I haven't heard of anybody permanently replaced. One person on staff has made, been made interim, but there is nobody permanent. So wh- who do you go to in this town? Can't go to the police. They're worse than uh, most of the criminals that you would ever find here. They're the ones who stole from us on a number of occasions. Recently, they were the ones who came and picked up Jennifer without a warrant and gave her to a bunch of idiots at the border who took her across and dumped her out in her basic garden wear, uh, just torn jeans and a a top with rubber shoes or something. And she came back five times over a period of a week and a half or so, two weeks. They just kept taking and dumping her, trying to find somebody on the U.S. side who would accept the fact that she was being dumped. And all of the supervisors on the U.S. side were saying, no, no, you can't do that. You need a court order to deport somebody. You can't just walk her over and dump her. She has no money. She has no clothes. And, you know, she's 3,000 miles from where she was raised. And they kept doing it. And when I told Jennifer that the information was being fed to the political level of the government, she told the guy from Legal Aid, uh, all of this information is going up to the government. And he looked at her and he said, the CBSA, the Canadian Border Security Agency, is the government of Canada. Now, that didn't shock me because I've known that all along. The the same people were running the border in Egypt during the 18th dynasty. They were running the border around Russia at the beginning of World War I. They are running all of the borders of the world. I don't know about the U.S. border because I haven't seen any stupid action on their part when it comes to Jennifer. But all over Europe, the borders are controlled by a group of people who do not, in fact, report to their government, but report to a secret uh, society, Some call them the Conference of Clerks. Others call them uh, 
ecclesiastic Freemasonry. They have uh, 15, 20 names that I've heard to date only to disguise the fact that they're all the same people. Same group. And it appears as if uh, De Beers, the diamond cartel, is one of the major players in the game. And that uh, drugs are brought into every country in the world, not because it's easy to do, but because the border guards are the ones doing the smuggling. Hmm. They're the ones who can cross the rivers that divide a lot of countries through their uh, border security apparatus. They're the ones who can let the trucks in without being looked at in detail. They're the ones who can tell people to come in on this particular shift so that uh, we'll be there uh, and you can hand over our cut and all of the money handed over for the movement of drugs is then used to bribe prosecutors, policemen, uh, and everybody up the line that are not part of their direct system. They steal from charities through hydro bills. When people get to be old and they're in a house by themselves, they start raising the bill for the cost of hydro, cost of electricity. And as the bill rises and the person can't pay, they give them an address in Lake, Lake Simcoe region north of Toronto of the United Appeal and call them up and tell them you can't pay your bill and you're going to be evicted from your property and they'll pay the bill. Is that what people have in mind when they make a donation annually to give off every paycheck a certain amount of money to United Appeal, that that money is going to go to Hydro? Uh, an organization that is supposed to be the property of the citizens of the province? Who paid for it? Is it anybody uh, uh, who grasps the concept that electromagnetism under a house is generated by surplus electricity being grounded into magnetic holding rocks. When uh, a rock is made up of, say, quartz and, and uh, something else uh, in the way of rock, uh, the quartz holds the electric charge. And when you reach a point during the winter when it freezes, that center explodes because it's trying to get bigger and the concrete-type rock that's holding it together is not expanding in the same manner, so it blows up. And what happens under a house the mirror in the room that you slept in sometimes here uh, with the big patio doors exploded one day last winter. The uh, middle window in the RV exploded into thousands of pieces. 
because it's the same thing as a microwave oven. I put thermometers outside in different locations, and it, the temperature can be uh, 60 degrees Fahrenheit in one place, and 10 feet away, the thermometer reads 140. And you look around, and all you see is where the wires are going over the top of the house are acting as a generator that picks up negative, positive vibes from the ground and sends it up towards the wires so you have a contact being made between uh, the electrical charges and that basically creates the same thing as if you were in a microwave oven and it's what happens in houses is is uh, uh, electromagnetism runs best on very thin wire so when they put a ground wire into the ground it's not a wire of the thickness of the 110 or 220 that they put in the house. It's all very thin wires wound together. So any surplus electricity sent by hydro into the house causes a surge, and it looks for a place to leave. And if you don't have surge protectors on your computer or TV, you can destroy them. It happened with my my uh, disc player here about a week and a half after we moved in. But if it goes to the ground and the ground has been set up with gravel and water that is uh, linked to moving electricity around and brings it up to big big rocks under a uh, miss constructed foundation so that where the foundation in other places might be a foot 18 inches thick in this place it's only four or five and the big rocks are placed right underneath there and basically when we sleep in the basement in the bed that I had to use for five years because I couldn't trust uh, Tom to keep the heating going in the house and that kind of stuff, I got the equivalent of a death blow in my stomach. And other people who've lived here have died, and other people who've lived here have given birth to uh, mentally handicapped children. And it's not just this house. The same thing happened across the street. But this house is different because there is no uh, normal construction. It's just wood. It's more built along the lines of a cottage that would be closed up for the winter. And you return in the spring by the lake someplace. But the fine wires, when the electricity comes in, picks up the wavelength that is required by electromagnetism and brings that magnetism to the different rooms through a telephone connection. Telephone lines are all very fine wires. And you can do the same thing to a house, to a business, to Walmart, to a, a skyscraper. The higher you go, the better it is even. Because it, it gets in line with lightning and stuff like that that can be picked up by the building. Now, because we know all of this, and we've told them that we know. 
They made sure that Tom would not be available in the house to pay rent. They made sure the city hall fire chief appointed a new girl to be an inspector. And she came out on the one day a week that we weren't here, we go shopping on Wednesdays, she came out and she said, first of all, she left her card in the door, saying, you have to remove those two vehicles that are an insult to the OPP for having made up stories on accidents on them and not investigated properly and not allow their ombudsman to deal with the problem and all of that stuff. Because we have a bylaw, she said on the telephone message, we have a bylaw that says that's not acceptable to the appearance of the property. And you have to remove anything that you've put in the way of display outside the gate of your property. So when I came home and I saw that, I moved everything that was outside the gate inside the gate, and she, in the morning, called Megan, even though Megan had put a letter on file at the city hall that she no longer owned the property. Her shares, 70%, had been transferred to Canadian Institute for Political Integrity. And that they should be dealing with me not as a tenant, but as the representative of the owner, as I was when she owned the shares for her. They refused to do that and sent her a threatening letter that they were going to sue her. Three times, Megan wrote to the city council and said, deal with Glenn Keeley. He's the one responsible, and I would have dealt with him, but they don't want me to be the one they have to deal with. They want to scare little old ladies. Finally, the date came that they were going to do it on their own and send us a bill. And I got Megan to write them a letter saying that if they believe that she's the owner of the property and she owns 70%, have they contacted Lynn, who owns 30% of the property and is also transferring the property to Canadian Institute for Political Integrity? If not, they better not touch anything on the property because they haven't informed who in their mind is the owner. I haven't heard of the city since then. They sent Megan another fax with an insult, um, something that a lawyer would use, but it was written by the fire chief with uh, absolutely no right to... Uh, to write that on his correspondence. Anyways, that was number two. Then we get number three. They come and kidnap Jennifer. I have made four applications to citizenship and immigration, and they don't act on them. I have gone to their refugee board and have waited for a response from the judge. It's something that's supposed to be done in 15, 20 days or something like that. And 
what they were looking for is information at the refugee board on what we knew rather than anything they needed and that process lasted over a year and a half to two years or something and then we get a call from an anthropologist saying that it had been denied and we said well send us a letter signed by the judge oh we don't do that I said you don't do that you're an anthropologist the judge described you in his court as don't worry about him he's just an office boy what are you doing telling me that it her thing has been denied send the documentation to the federal court because we're going to be applying to the federal court and we only had a day left in the amount of time and we got it done they never sent the documentation and the federal court closed the file without telling us until the day after they closed it and then they arrest Jennifer and won't let her even get closed and they don't have a legal warrant nothing signed by a judge and then they put her through this process which is now 50 days in jail taken her to Brockville from Ottawa every time to appear in court and nobody wants to be part of this scam because they all know it's going to explode in their faces every time it's a different person from legal aid and every time they tell Jennifer uh, the people of Canada don't want you here That's basically the same thing as the girls did when she tried to come in after we got married in 2010. Who the hell are these people to tell us who we can get married to and live with? Everybody else in the country who has a wife they've married from outside the country simply bring her in. But of course we have the Vic Taves element of the fact that the Minister of Public Safety had raped Jennifer in California when she was a young woman. And we have a Prime Minister who appointed him. Now we have um, a judge who said to Jennifer, we got to get a trial going. Jennifer said, I want a trial, but I don't want the trial here. I want a trial in Ottawa. I want a change of venue because this is a criminal gang running the show in Brockville for the CBSA. You can't get a fair trial here. The judge said, I can't do that, but is there any way you can get a lawyer outside? So the cell makes arrangements, and, and who do they choose? They choose the guy who was the ombudsman for the Premier of Ontario, who just got fired by the Premier, <laughs> and said, there's a guy who's pissed off enough at the Premier and has just done the study on um, Hydro Ontario, which he once described on the radio as trying to get a hold of anybody that can make a decision on hydro is like trying to grab a greased pig on a farm. This guy is supposed to give an answer tomorrow or Friday about whether or not he'll take the case, but he has to talk to his lawyer first. 
Can you imagine the information he would bring with him on the criminal activity that is occurring at Ontario Hydro? And the criminal activity that is occurring in the province of Ontario in the Premier's office because he's been reporting to the Premier for years, different Premiers. His name is André Marin. André is DNA twice, R-E means back again. Marin is marinating. Mary, the Virgin Mary, was marinated instead of um, screwed. Genetically engineered children are the products of marination using electromagnetism. The Bible refers to uh, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came a-tumbling down. Well, why did the walls go a-tumbling down? Well, he was carrying an electromagnetic device seven times around the town as a symbol. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. That's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a situation here in which the controllers of the world have determined that their team of controlled people in North America have lost their value and the future genetically engineered persons who will man a space program need a different marination. And therefore, if you were to flood the entire St. Lawrence Seaway starting at Lake Superior and all the Great Lakes down through the U.S., to Flushing, New York, through Flushing Meadows, that what you would in fact do is get rid of the people who've been causing the problem. They're people who have been causing the problem. And then you wouldn't have to worry about the people who knew what you were doing reporting you because you would have also at the same time taken out first responders. That means you'd be free to do anything you want to do militarily without worrying about first responders, police, firemen, border security would mostly be gone. And so would everything they need to do work with, because they're all by the waterway. That's what's going on. They don't care how many millions of bystanders die in the process. They'd only have to kill them with war, pestilence, famine, or disease if they didn't flood them out with water or with gases such as radon. There are 30-some nuclear reactors parked up at the junction of Lake Huron and Lake Michigan that were supposed to be sent to Sweden for dismantling and resale as parts. None of the mayors in the towns along the seaway would allow ships to go by their place 
with a nuclear reactor intact on it. I remember that. That's why they're all parked, right where they'll be picked up by the flood. So that's what's happening at this house. I've heard what's happening at your house, and the cats are waiting for supper. <laughs> so if you want to continue the discussion, call me tomorrow. Okay. All right, Clay. Bye. Okay.